news is that um, not going to be talking about neurotransmitter systems and uh, you know, the things like that, which um, I'm sure you won't be too you know, crushed. Especially, uh, that would be good also maybe to promote wakefulness in the group. That would be a good thing. Um, but I've uh, been uh, giving this talk for a few years, and uh, it's really meant to sort of be a sort of practical uh, uh, approach towards what might be helpful for you all as far as your work on towards the social workers uh, and the kinds of things that you might be coming into contact with the kind of situations. Uh, and uh, is that my tip? <laughs> It's heads, it's mine. Uh, anyway. uh, and uh, so, if uh, you know, it's, it's sort of an informal talk, but if you'll have any any questions as we go along, feel free to raise your hand, uh, and um, I'll try my best to answer it. Uh, if I mention something that maybe I don't explain well enough, which I sometimes have a tendency to do, uh, sooner maybe that. You know, you might have a better idea of what I'm referring to, let me know that also. Okay? So basically, the talk is in two parts. The first part, we're going to talk about uh, sort of basic psychopharmacology principles. And then, uh, we're sort of, the second part is going over the uh, classes of medications. Uh, that part tends to maybe can go a little bit faster. That's the stuff that sometimes easier to get out of the book or to look up if you need to. Uh, has anybody in your course of your studies thus far uh, had a client who's taking psychotropic medication? Or, yeah. uh, and did you have to uh, have any contact with uh, the psychiatrist at all? Or? Yeah, I work, I, work, uh, I work closely with a psychiatrist. Most of my clients are, are my clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of them are on medication. Have you ever uh, had any uh, uh, time where maybe you, you were asked a direct question about a side effect or a client had concerns about medication that sort of might be something they would ask the doctor, but that they might have asked you because you're there with them and it made them more comfortable with you? Most of my sessions gear around them taking their medication, their side effects, their reaction, if the medication is working, how they feel about it emotionally. And so I do, I ask, like on a regular basis, are they following their regimen? Because I work with uh, substance abusers, and so sometimes they don't take their medication and they use drugs. Sure, sure. They, uh, people, <coughs> people take, sometimes they take their own medication. Uh, but, um, you know, whether they call it uh, compliance or adherence, that certainly is one of the, the biggest uh, uh, challenges, uh, I think, with, uh, with treating anybody, whether it's use or not. It's the, uh, you know, uh, I think as you were referring to, uh, medications uh, have a, a, a large meaning to people. Uh, and lots of times we don't really know what the meaning is until they can explore it. If I, uh, you know, uh, taking uh, something for my cholesterol, uh, you know, that might be easy for me to take or not so easy to take. It maybe reminds me that my father had a heart disease and so I don't want to have heart disease. And so the best way for me to not have uh, heart disease is not to take the medication. <coughs> you know, uh, that's probably the basis behind most of when we uh, either miss, a, miss a dose or stop taking something, it's the best, quickest way to convince ourselves that there's not, not a problem. Because every time you know, we open up the bottle, we're sort of making a conscious decision. We don't always think about it that way, uh, but, uh, you know, but we are. Um, have you had any uh, difficulties interacting with a psychiatrist or Go smoothly, or is it something that uh, we've actually become best friends. <laughs> best friends. I'm sorry to hear that. What's <laughs> <laughs> become friends as a psychiatrist? <laughs> only one. You only, you only want one. Only one. Because, um, 
Has anybody else had any interactions with, uh, with patients that have psychotropic, that are on psychotropic meds or had a, a, a problem as far as not knowing how to handle it? Or? I, I work with HIV and so they're actually usually on cocktail in addition to the psychotropic meds. So we work very closely with um, the doctor and the psychiatrist, but it was a challenge because they take a lot of medication with HIV and that was the reason why not to take the psychotropic meds. Because they're, they're already on so many medications. Yeah, and regimens and then right. the interacting with two different medications they figured that there were side effects because of the medication as opposed to because they're inconsistent with their medication. Right, so it gets, it gets, it gets quite complex, the, the, side dynamic, the side effects, but also all of the dynamics and the, the, there's a lot of fertile areas there where someone can either look for or if you're looking for something to convince oneself that there's plenty there. Yeah, they do uh, that a lot. It sounds like the two of you work in a setting where the psychiatrist is readily available and sort of work as a team, which is nice. It's not, it doesn't always, uh, it's not always the, the scenario. Sometimes the psychiatrist is, you know, someone that you're trying to get on the phone and so on. Um, but um, uh, so, uh, but I, yeah, I'm glad that you already are having some of these uh, experiences. So hopefully, what. I go over uh, with you all today, you know, will help at some point. It would be nice. Not, not right away, maybe five years from now. We'll you know, probably that, you know, that, that, talk about that. Um, so, um, you know, oftentimes uh, you all might be the first ones who are uh, approached by a patient or a client <laughs> with some concern about medication, you know, for example. Uh, working with children and they have a parent who's concerned uh, that their child is taking some medication for ADD. And they may, you know, that's sort of a somewhat controversial, you know, issue. Uh, uh, and um, they may ask you about it or want to know your opinion about it or ask you direct questions in their heads. And now it was so easy to know how to, look, how to handle that. I think sometimes having some, you know, information uh, is a good thing uh, to at least have some basis to, to begin uh, to answer something or help someone, but then also to know what uh, one doesn't know and, and how to help somebody get the information that they need so they can make the best decision. Um, so again, I'm going to try and focus on what's, you know, sort of most practical uh, uh, for you all, and, um, and again, if there's any questions as we go along, uh, raise your hand. Um, you know, psychiatry has come a long way in the last few decades, um, uh, but I always have to remind myself that the brain is really the, you know, the final frontier, so to speak, in the human body. Probably the most complex organ, and uh, there's so much that we have yet to know. And I think that um, you know, uh, psychopharmacology sometimes uh, is a, a trial and error uh, approach. Uh, probably, it's with less, right? Uh, who wants to be uh, treated with something that's more trial and error? But uh, the, it's about, you know, it's, it's just like if someone has chronic back pain, 80% uh, of chronic back pain is difficult to diagnose or to understand what's causing it. Uh, so, you know, psychopharmacology is not exact, uh, and sometimes trial and error is the best we have to offer. But uh, if it is trial and error, uh, it, it, that's supposed to be compatible with uh, you know, uh, making the best decision and reducing the risk and trying to make sure always that the benefits outweigh the risks of treatment. That, that applies to anything. Um, okay. The other thing is that uh, with any kind of medical treatment, you want to uh, try and fix the problem without causing a new problem 
or another problem. And that's, that's you know, what the you know, side effects are probably the most common example of that. Uh, you know, most of the original psychiatric medications uh, were discovered sort of incidentally. Thorazine, which uh, isn't really used much anymore, it's one of the first antipsychotics, uh, was developed, you know, uh, maybe about four, 50 eight, so years ago. Uh, by accident, there was an anesthesiologist who was trying to come up with a medication to give to his patients before they had surgery. So that would dry up this, their secretions. Uh, and they discovered sort of accidentally that people that would hear voices, their voices would go like this. Um, but a lot of the uh, uh, initial first line medications, or the first generation rather, had uh, a lot of serious, sometimes terrible side effects. Uh, and the analogy it was almost like trying to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. Right? You don't need such a big, big you know, hammer to kill a fly. And so uh, we've gotten better with that, but still there are side effects uh, that uh, are easier to manage than before. But nonetheless, probably the biggest obstacle uh, is uh, there are side effects or potential for side effects with a lot of uh, medications. Okay. Any questions? As far as the, the goals of uh, uh, pharmaco pharmacotherapy, um, pretty uh, uh, you know, logical uh, to restore normal functioning and range of emotions. Um, that sometimes can get a little murky because what's, what's normal, that's you know, not as, so easy to, uh, to, to judge or determine. Um, but medications are used oftentimes acutely. Uh, if someone has something going on right now, like a panic attack, um, depression, mania, something like that. Um, they're also uh, uh, used on a continual basis uh, to uh, keep someone from having a relapse. Usually relapses within the first six months or so of, a, uh, of an episode. Uh, and then medications are also used to maintain someone uh, to prevent a recurrence uh, of the same disorder. And uh, so someone who, let's say, has bipolar disorder might be on lithium or Depakote for an extended period of time uh, to maintain them from having a recurrence of their, of their illness. But those are pretty much the, the main uh, the reasons that we use medication in a perfect world, anyone that's taking uh, medication <coughs> would uh, be explained and would, be, would know precisely why they're taking it. Um, uh, I guess if you asked random people, they, they may not have this uh, kind of model in their mind, but um, uh, hopefully the person that's treating them does, uh, because uh, oftentimes one of the problems that we get into in, in medicine and certainly psychiatry is that those people are prescribed medications and are sort of left on them uh, without um, either uh, monitoring them adequately or determining whether or not uh, something can be reduced or lowered or if someone's on, you know, what kind of cocktails, maybe, you know, Couple of ingredients could be taken out of the cocktail, uh, so it's maybe not as strong, um, and things like that. Um, certainly, psychiatric disorders uh, can be very uh, unpredictable. Don't always uh, people don't always present or show up the way that you might read about it in the in the book. Um, um, not everybody responds the same way to a particular medication. Uh, medications are not always uh, as effective uh, in one person as opposed to another. And um, can oftentimes take months, uh, weeks, 
weeks or months for medication to uh, become fully effective. For example, you know, the antidepressants, which uh, really a misnomer because they're also used for anxiety. Um, for example, uh, Prozac is used for clinical depression. It's also used for eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder. Those are considered anxiety disorders. People can get depressed uh, secondarily because they have a, a problem like that that is affecting their life and maybe they, they get depressed over the consequences. Um, but uh, with anxiety disorders, people will generally need much higher doses of the same medication that you would use for depression. And oftentimes it takes more, so it takes longer to build up the dose. It also takes longer for someone to get the full therapeutic effect. Uh, during that time, people could be having a rough time, could be suffering, and so on. Um, but uh, uh, it can take sometimes months for uh, the medication, so they make the full effect. Sometimes they could, medications could begin to work within a month or so or several weeks. Uh, but again, uh, it could sometimes take several months for the full effect. Um, medications are, uh, do have real limitations. Um, they can't, uh, quote unquote, cure the uh, character or someone or personality issues. Um, there are some elements of personality, such as uh, interpersonal hypersensitivity, for example, which sometimes can respond to medications. But uh, as far as sort of someone's psychological makeup, unfortunately medications, that's not something medications can necessarily um, uh, target, although someone has a good response to a medication, um, uh, let's say that they're depressed, uh, and they also have some personality issues that their depression is alleviated, so it's going to be a lot easier for them, uh, for someone working with them, to figure out, help them figure out what, what it is they do they might need to change how they're approaching things. Um, so in that sense, the medication can help to sort of allow access to somebody's internal you know, experiences. Um, another point that's uh, important to keep in mind is that uh, there can sometimes be a tendency, and I think maybe uh, you all that shared some of your experiences earlier uh, might have, might see this sometimes or, or wonder if this is what's going on. Um, <coughs> that someone, for example, who has uh, an anxiety disorder, has, let's say, uh, get panic attacks, or has uh, social anxiety. Uh, it's uh, not uncommon for someone to uh, sort of get into a pattern of thinking that anytime they feel anxious, it's because of their psychiatric problem. Um, and so the uh, uh, solution oftentimes can become, well, I, I need more medication medication is not working. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of an example of something that's called sort of over-pathologizing. Right? It, it sometimes can be difficult to discriminate what is sort of normal anxiety, what is sort of over-the-top anxiety, especially for someone that hasn't really had much of a track record, uh, as we might have, sort of being able to determine what's Sort of baseline, you know, anxiety that most people might have, um, as opposed to something that's excessive, um, and so that's something that is sort of a, you know, an understandable, uh, almost a sort of a hazard of having one of these problems. Um, obviously, the, you know, I think most people would agree that sort of human experience uh, requires us to be able to feel happy, right? going to uh, uh, be able to feel happy, you have to be able to experience sadness, right? you have to be able to tolerate or experience anxiety, if you're going to be able to feel, you know, relief, uh, and so on. And so, right, you can't have one with, without the other. I think certainly uh, people that fall into, into substance abuse, I, that could be an example of what happens when somebody wishes to uh, uh, maybe 
to sort of have uh, 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 altered the sort of the human experience where they they're, they're not they don't they don't want to feel bad bad, and so they might reach for something to take them out of that state. Uh, unfortunately, right, that's something that we, everyone can relate to. We all look for things to help us forget and feel uh, forget our troubles and so on. Uh, but uh, it generally has to be something that doesn't cause more problems that helps without without harming. So that's a sort of a very common, um, you know, a, occurrence that that people that have uh, a psychiatric condition can sometimes have a tendency to uh, uh, make a conclude that what they're feeling is is, is always or uh, is probably due to their psychiatric condition. And again, it's something that's easy to understand um, and empathize with if someone has just had a, you know, a terrible episode of depression, uh, and they were suicidal, let's say, uh, and now it's six months later, and uh, they had a good response to medication, and um, they have, uh, they lose their job, but let's say, uh, that, that, that's sort of, uh, it's uh, something that most people might get depressed about. And so uh, how do you then figure out, well, they're feeling down, is that something that is, is medication not working? Uh, I think in general we look for uh, more of an extended period of time where someone is having uh, symptoms of depression, which, which is more than just feeling down. It's feeling helpless and hopeless or lack of interest in things that someone used to like to do for enjoyment and so on. Um, which is why it's always, uh, what I should have mentioned a few minutes ago, is it's always important and essential to do a thorough uh, examination uh, and to uh, have a firm diagnosis before treating someone. So uh, it should be well, uh, you seem pretty, you seem down or depressed, why don't you take some Zoloft and, you know, come see me in six months or something. Um, right? It's, it's, it's got to be more scientific than that. There's a whole body of research and literature about how to determine what's, what the depression is. So it's, it's sort of, that's the art of psychopharmacology, which is uh, the skill that the treater uh, uh, is required to have uh, in order to decide um, when to intervene and how to determine the right balance between pharmacological and psychological um, uh, approaches to their treatment. Uh, and again, there's uh, not always, uh, the, there's always gray areas that uh, make it more fun and more challenging. Unfortunately, in psychiatry, as most of you probably know, unfortunately, there are not as many uh, or any diagnostic tests. So there's no x-rays, right? You can't send somebody for a blood test to find out, okay, your such and such number is coming down, so you must be less depressed, right? It's not, it's not like an infection, right? So it has pneumonia, you see the spot on the x-ray, give them antibiotics, take another x-ray, a few weeks later, hope the spot is smaller. Even with x-rays, it's not always so easy to tell. But in psychiatry, it's generally always uh, the information that we get from the patient, uh, which uh, is, uh, you know, the good news, it's also the bad news, because uh, oftentimes I could ask somebody who has insomnia, have you been sleeping? And uh, they'll say, terrible. And um, it might be that they slept terrible the night before. And so, uh, tendency sometimes for people to report their most recent bad night of sleep uh, when in fact so it can appear as if the insomnia is not improved but that might not necessarily be the case um, which is why I oftentimes uh, with something like insomnia like to use uh, charts have people keep track of how they've been sleeping um, because a lot of people don't it's not something that uh, probably maybe over the years, I'd say maybe one out of 10 people uh, 
uh, that can keep track of uh, how they're sleeping. But uh, again, I think the more objective we can make this type of treatment, the better. <coughs> um, you know, I think, I think some of you had mentioned before you have patients that are on all these cocktails and so on. Um, well, it might be some of the times that a person has more than one psychiatric diagnosis. Um, that is very common. So somebody who has uh, an attention deficit disorder can also have uh, alcoholism. They can also have recurrent depression because uh, they can't study. Uh, they're failing out of school. Uh, they may see all their friends passing them by. Um, they're not able to earn a living. They're going to get depressed about that. Uh, that might contribute to, you know, alcoholism. Um, and so uh, people can have anxiety problems, uh, depression, you know, concurrently. So again, it's 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 almost the the, uh, the rule until for me at least until proven otherwise. Uh, was that someone doesn't necessarily have just one diagnosis or, or one, one problem. Um, that's something that's always important to think about, especially if someone is responding to a particular medication. <coughs> there may be another diagnosis that still has not been uh, revealed yet. It's always important to remember that with something like bipolar disorder, uh, they've done studies where they find that uh, it's not unusual for people to not be diagnosed with bipolar disorder until maybe they've seen their sixth psychiatrist over a period of 20 years or so. Um, and um, so a lot of these conditions are, are not e easily diagnosable and sometimes are uh, 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 active but uh, uh, not um, for whatever reason, either maybe a person maybe doesn't feel what their symptoms are, they're not asked the right questions, and so on. And so again, I think it's not uncommon for someone to have more than one psychiatric diagnosis. Um, symptoms can certainly uh, interfere with treatment. Um, you know, we're talking about um, uh, we're talking about compliance before. Certainly, uh, uh, denial. Let's, let's say more commonly, it's, let's say schizophrenia. Well, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's almost uh, surprising that someone who has schizophrenia w would take their medication, at least in the, in the beginning, uh, because the hallmark of schizophrenia in general, uh, or certain you know, variants of schizophrenia, is sort of denial or psychotic denial. So if someone, let's say, is paranoid, um, uh, well, uh, they don't have the problem. You have the problem, so I don't need to take medication, um, right? So that certainly gets in the way of treatment. And then also, in the case of paranoia, um, right? the more uh, I talk to someone who's paranoid, generally the more paranoid or suspicious I'm going to make them, because they will be interpreting everything I'm telling them in a way that uh, makes them worry even more that I'm trying to deceive them. So those are sort of you know, very common areas where the psychiatric symptoms uh, can really interfere with, uh, with the treatment. Um, as far as uh, another thought about adherence uh, or compliance, um, I remember reading an article many years ago that suggested asking people, instead of, do you ever miss your medication, to ask them, how often do you miss your medication? Um, that, that has a tendency to lead towards a more accurate response. Um, and I've never had anybody uh, get you know, mad at me uh, or feel like I'm <coughs> assuming something that's not so, because that question is a little bit of a, of a um, you know, certainly is implying that the person is already missing, and you're, and you're assuming that. But uh, I've never had anybody get upset about it. I think it leads to uh, 
uh, definitely more accurate answer. A lot easier to say, you have a miscommunication with uh, someone who is maybe ashamed to talk about it or worries the doctor's going to get mad at them or, uh, or something along those lines. Uh, it's a lot easier to say, to, you know, to know to that question. Uh, if, uh, if you ask them, how often do you miss? It sort of is showing them already that you're not mad unless you scream it at them, which you don't do. <laughs> But um, it, it sort of also communicates that um, it's, it's okay for you to tell me. Um, and uh, so that question like that is sort of a little bit of a subtle difference and it can really go uh, a long way. Um, another important point to uh, always keep in mind is uh, to be constantly aware of medical issues that are going on with someone. Um, can't always assume that someone's symptoms are psychiatric. Um, anybody know what's sort of a common psychiatric disorder that um, can only be uh, made or diagnosed after making sure that someone doesn't have any medical conditions? Something that could look like, the symptoms look like they're psychiatric. Anxiety and you know yes. Dementia. Uh, dementia. Uh, dementia. Yeah, possibly. I was thinking of something else, but certainly dementia. Uh, we know so little about um, how to you know uh, uh, treat or help people pharmacologically with the agitation uh, or the, sometimes the delusions that go along with them. <coughs> But certainly, if someone has dementia, um, they can also have uh, be depressed, clinically depressed. Um, and um, uh -huh. you were say something? I was thinking maybe um, like something neurological. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what, but like um, I guess those things would have to be ruled out first. Yeah. Kids in the certain communities that can appear um, psychiatric. Yeah, absolutely. If someone uh, could uh, be having a stroke and have difficulty speaking, and that could look like maybe they're having a thought disorder. Um, uh, a panic attack is a very common uh, condition that people feel like they could have been to die. Um, and uh, you know, oftentimes people that have their first panic attacks will go to a medical emergency room with chest pain, shortness of breath. Uh, literally feeling like they're, they're gonna they're gonna die, um, and um, uh, right, you can't say, oh boy, you're having this person having a panic attack, until you really make sure that they're not having any cardiac, occur you know, uh, issues, especially you know, depending on their age. Uh, right, less worry if it's someone's 20 years old as opposed to 55 or 60 uh, years old. Um, but it's always important to be thinking about that there are any medical problems that are going on at the same time which could all be causing uh, emotional symptoms or worsening somebody's uh, psychiatric or uh, emotional symptoms. Um, which is why uh, someone that uh, appears to have clinical depression, uh, especially for the first time, uh, needs to have their thyroid level checked, make sure that they're not anemic, um, uh, that they don't have vitamin deficiencies, um, for example, B12 and folate. They, those can all cause uh, conditions which look exactly like clinical depression. <laughs> and so uh, antidepressants is not going to uh, help somebody who has a low thyroid. <coughs> is feeling fatigued and uh, not interested in things and feeling down and having trouble concentrating. Uh, right? Those are all symptoms of depression. They're also symptoms of low thyroid. So that's why it's always important to be uh, thinking about and ruling out uh, uh, medical uh, issues. Uh, one of the, the main areas where I can mess up as a psychiatrist is assuming something is psychiatric when it's not. Uh, 
one could have something quite serious going on. Um, pancreatic cancer, for example, most commonly presents as depression. Um, and so, uh, not that uh, I might not uh, begin to treat someone for that, but at the same time, I want to kind of make sure that not, not something else going on, either something else psychiatric or something medical. Um, a lot of times with our vets now that are coming back, they have traumatic brain injury that doesn't uh, like come about for several months uh, until they get back. And the first thing you see is like behavioral changes. That might be something that you would yeah, look for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that, that's <laughs> certainly something that uh, <coughs> seems we have a better uh, idea about how post-traumatic stress disorder uh, can uh, be quote-unquote delayed not always within the first few weeks <coughs> occur months later. Postpartum depression can uh, occur within up to a year after delivery. Uh, by that time, uh, maybe people are not necessarily even remembering that someone was a veteran uh, or that someone had a baby six months ago. Um, so that's why you all uh, might be the only ones, the only professionals that maybe sort of have uh, uh, the best idea of a person's life, uh, their experiences, where they've been, uh, what they've been doing, uh, their medical issues, psychiatric issues, to be able to sort of piece them all together to look at the big picture. You know, the way that uh, you know, medicine uh, has, I guess, evolved uh, or changed over the all the subspecialization. Right? Someone who has diabetes, let's say, right? they have, uh, uh, can have, uh, uh, have to go to an ophthalmologist because of the uh, you know, effects of diabetes on their eye. Uh, they could go to a neurologist for the neuropathy from the diabetes. They can go to an endocrinologist to help them regulate their, their glucose. Um, and, uh, these doctors might not know what the other one treatment is uh, involved, and um, you know there isn't always the primary care doctor. Uh, sometimes you, know, you all might need to serve in that role to be able to sort of keep everything, all the information, sort of in your mind and be able to sort of formulate it together. Certainly, post-traumatic stress disorder and, and traumatic brain injury is um, uh, seeing what uh, is sort of the devastation for the people that are serving uh, with, you know, our forces and what they are uh, having to deal with. And it's very, very difficult. And, uh, government, as we know, reading in the newspaper, is really time treating, keeping up um, with uh, and, and diagnosing. <coughs> Sometimes even the, the sense that uh, people are uh, not being forthcoming, they're exaggerating their symptoms, they're making symptoms up. And, you know, I used to work for, I used to do um, um, uh, independent uh, psychiatric evaluations for uh, the MTA. Um, so it's a subway conductor who was traumatized because they're pulling the train into the station and somebody beeps into the track. I mean, that's, that, that'll keep you up at night, you know, uh, and that can sometimes keep people up for months. Um, and um, so sometimes there would be a sense, you know, sort of an implication that somebody is uh, mistaken should be better by now. And, um, uh, not so really sort of operating not in the vacuum, but we're trying to help people in the context of whatever system that we're in. And sometimes it's not always geared for the, the maybe the best outcome. Um, um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, target symptoms. <coughs> uh, for uh, 
pharmacological treatment. And this is an area that um, unfortunately is, is not, uh, I see in, in uh, the world of psychiatry, uh, probably not stressed or thought about enough. Um, that can lead to a lot of maybe misunderstanding um, about what psychiatrists can do, what psychiatry can do, what is the medication working, is it not working, is it working uh, uh, in, with some things, is it not as effective with other things. Um, so uh, it's always, I think, very helpful to be able to determine in advance what is it that you're treating? How are you going to know <coughs> if this antidepressant works? Um, how are you going to know if the Valium works, or the uh, Xanax, or the, the Prozac, or the Lithium, um, or the Ambien? Uh, so uh, it has to be more than just have you been sleeping, or has your you know are you feeling less depressed? Um, need to be able to sort of quantify, uh, uh, you know, we'll know if this medication is working if instead of having uh, a panic attack every other week, or uh, you'll have one once a year, twice a year, um, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, we'll know that the antidepressant is working if you are reading books again getting a better night's sleep, uh, if you're more interested in <coughs> spending time with your family, that kind of thing, um, uh, or feeling less withdrawn. Uh, with psychosis, we know an antipsychotic is, is helping if the uh, hallucinations are less frequent, or they're maybe not as intense, um, because a lot of medications are dependent on the dose and the amount of time that people are taking them. Um, and it's important to be able to determine uh, whether someone is having a partial response or, or no response um, or an incomplete response. For example, uh, you know, with uh, clinical depression, about 50% of people only respond partially uh, uh, to a medication. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that the medication isn't working. Uh, it might mean that maybe someone needs a little bit more time on the medication, that they might need a higher dose and so on. But un unless you know uh, what, how it's helped, how it hasn't helped, you can't really make the best decision uh, uh, to determine what the, next, what the next step is. So again, it's, it's, it's something that I can't, can't um, you know, overemphasize enough importance of uh, being able to know exactly what you're, you're targeting, what you're focusing on. You know, what is this, what is this medication uh, uh, for? How are you going to know if it's effective? There are some things like um, attention deficit disorder that are you know, generally much easier to determine. If someone takes uh, an Adderall uh, within a half an hour, right? Ideally, they should be sitting and being able to read for three, four hours, as opposed to before, when after 30 seconds, maybe they would get up and see what's in the refrigerator, or flip on the TV, or look at their computer, right? So you ask somebody you know, to monitor that, right? General people will, it's not that, <laughs> it's not that subtle. Uh, someone will say, wow, I took this, and 20 minutes later, I read a whole chapter. I haven't been able to read a whole chapter in my, in my, in my whole life before. Um, but it's not always that clear cut with ADD, and, uh, but it usually is, but it, with a lot of other conditions, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy to tell uh, by just asking a question or two. So again, it's important to be able to, to, to really know what it is that you're focusing in on. Okay. Another, I think, very, very crucial um, principle of psychopharmacology is what constitutes a, 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 a medication trial. Uh, 
uh, in a, a good med a medication trial is supposed to be taking uh, an adequate dose, being on a good enough dose for enough time. Can't have one without the other, right? So if I'm seeing somebody for the first time and uh, <coughs> they say, well, I've been on Paxil and I've been on Zoloft and I've been on uh, Prozac both and none of, none of them work. Um, I need to find out, can't always, you know, if I can, um, what was the dose you were taking, how long did you take it for? Because um, but most of the time, uh, someone says, yeah, I was on Zoloft, and it didn't really help. Um, I had many times where, you know, if I ask them, how, well, remember the dose? and maybe they'll have to call a pharmacy or maybe they'll remember, and it'll be 25 milligrams. 25 milligrams is a, like a baby dose, it's like a starter dose, and that happens a lot. Sometimes it happens, uh, maybe, um, an internist might start someone on Zoloft and do a prescription for 25 milligrams and with, you know, 10 refills and that, you know, that's it. And so, you know, the, the um, therapeutic dose of Zola between 100 and 200 milligrams. So uh, it's not that the Zola didn't help, uh, or it didn't work rather, uh, it's that they didn't, it didn't get a chance to work. Um, uh, or if somebody took something for a week and stopped it for whatever reason. And so, um, uh, so that's always important to be thinking about what constitutes a medication trial has to be on a good enough dose for enough time. <coughs> um, son kind of answered it, but um, the antidepressants in adolescents and stuff like young children, I think that within the first month, um, being on that medication increases the risk of suicidal ideation. Um, is it just after the first month, or is it on a continual basis that? Um, I guess I don't know side effects or is that the normal range of um, yeah the antidepressants have what's called a, a black box warning which is um, you know that big PDR which now you can download on your phone uh, but black box warning is when you're flipping through and you're looking up Prozac let's say there'll be something in the uh, right underneath the you know where it says Prozac in a black box that will uh, mention, uh, that will say, uh, uh, you know, caution in, in adult children and adolescents, or you know, there are some uh, uh, antibiotics that can cause uh, tendons to rupture. So that, that that's <coughs> the black box supposed to be for the, you know, warning. Um, the um, concern about increasing suicidal activity in children and adolescents with antidepressants is within the first several weeks. It's not something, if it was something that puts someone at higher risk, you know, chronically, that, God forbid, that would be kind of horrible. Um, it's usually something that um, if someone's monitored, uh, if they have, you know, uh, it's something that, no, no reason to have any, any terrible, you know, catastrophic outcome. I think it's, steady these medications, it's usually if someone's prescribe something and they're not being looked out for. You know, probably the bigger concern with the antidepressants as far as dangerousness is uh, if someone is, let's say, profound, and this, this is, you know, goes back for decades, somebody is profoundly depressed uh, and maybe they're, you know, giving up on life and uh, thinking about uh, they're better off dead and maybe thinking or fantasizing or planning about hurting themselves, how they would kill themselves. Um, but they're so depressed they have no energy to do anything. Put them on an antidepressant, it starts to work. Um, and two weeks later, they're still very depressed, but maybe they have a little bit more energy. That's the, when you gotta really watch somebody. Um, because they might be able to uh, carry out something that they were thinking about. Um, that's that's uh, 
sort of a, an area that is crucial to watch. Yeah. In terms of insurance and general practitioners prescribing medications like antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs, have you found that this has been extremely problematic since they're not really following them through completely um, on the reaction to those medications? It, it potentially can be. I think it. Uh, Do you think it's a growing problem, though? Uh, that I uh, couldn't say. I mean, you know, I always goes have to remember. You're asking a psychiatrist, so I'm like, hey, what are they doing giving that stuff out? You know, um, either because I, you know, <coughs> they come see me, or you know, threatened that someone else is doing something that I'm doing. Also, uh, it, it can it can work out fine. Uh, if right there's some uh, right if, if somebody's treating somebody uh, and they are uh, knowledgeable in, in the treatments right that's great if not uh, and you don't let's say get referred to a psychiatrist uh, yeah that's that's a problem whether it's a growing problem you know yeah, maybe it is um, but it certainly is, you know, if, you look, if you're looking at it on a case-by-case case individual basis, uh, it could be a, a, a problem. Um, you know, there could sometimes be a tendency for an internist to write a prescription with, you know, eight refills. Um, and uh, if the person cancels their appointment, maybe they're not being called, that kind of a thing. Um, but, you know, usually it works out very well. Someone could maybe be started on a medication and then referred to a psychiatrist, or if the internist or primary care practitioner uh, has somebody that they work with, psychologist, social worker, you know, so it, it can work out well. I think that, um, you know, if it is a growing problem, uh, it might be because there's less access to psychiatrists sometimes. Uh, it's, always, it's always the stigma of seeing a psychiatrist. Right, it's a lot easier to, if I go to an internist if I have stomach pain, uh, and so I can you know go to an internist. Um, but my stomach pain might be because I'm very nervous or depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, uh, most people that commit suicide, let's say, or just, just think of an example, have seen a non-psychiatric physician in the I think six months prior. Um, usually for that reason. And the fantasy can sometimes be that I'm going to see a doctor, right? If someone has the flu, if I have the flu, let's say, my main job is I just gotta get to the doctor's office. Once I'm there, I don't really need to, you know, what worry. He or she's gonna take my blood tests, take my temperature and so on, and give me a prescription. In psychiatry, it's, it's different. It requires more of a sort of an ongoing collaboration, um, and so, um, you know, that always doesn't work out, uh, right, it's more work, and it takes more time, so that sometimes it can be, um, uh, uh, it can be sort of problematic, because in general, right, in, in life, right, and then you all have exams coming up, there's, there's really no shortcut, right, you've got to study your exams or write your papers, Anytime someone finds a shortcut, right, there's some shortcuts that could be great. There's some shortcuts that, you know, can seem like they're great at the time, but, you know, if I'm using, you know, my sister's paper or something and turning that in, you know, I'm going to probably, right, it's going to affect me at some point uh, down, down the road, if not now, but maybe in the future. Yeah. Can I just go back to the question for a second? Do you think it's the same mechanism for children and adolescents who are newly taking antidepressants and have more of a suicidal ideation as the one that you described for adults? Well, what I was describing could be for anybody. Oh, if somebody is... Um, so is that your understanding of how children and adolescents might have more suicidal activity? Yeah, there, there is, there, there could be a sensitivity to the serotonin that can... Uh, uh, cause sort of a state of, sort of agitation that can uh, um, exacerbate it. If someone has some suicidal thoughts or ideation, uh, they might uh, feel so bad and, and anxious and restless and, 
they might act on. That seems to be sort of one of the main theories sort of behind why children and adolescents might be, have, a, have a sensitivity to, to the medication as opposed to adults. A lot of it we don't fully understand about the developing brain. Does that, contra does that uh, uh, probably makes a difference between why an adult responds differently than a child? You know, I, I think that, um, I think what a lot of people did, I think there's big things on the news and people have been reading about, but you know, there's, there's no doubt that um, what's happening is a lot of medications that are being prescribed to children are, are not, are, aren't being studied in children, right? Um, the same thing is going on with, uh, with dementia. Uh, dementia is all the, the agitation is being treated with antipsychotics. It's never been proven that the antipsychotics help. Um, right? it's, that's what happens when either we don't have enough information or uh, you know, maybe someone can have good intentions that they want to help, but uh, again, uh, they, they sort of want to do something. But sometimes, uh, you know, there isn't something that one can do. Uh, and certainly don't want to cause another problem just, you know, out of that, that need. But, you know, with the antipsychotics um, and antidepressants, I mean, the antidepressants, that's a perfect example of something that, right, that medications were approved and, you know, most of the time, the study is done and, you know, following people for like six weeks or so, um, right? And so you can't assume that because the medication's been approved by the FDA, that it's been studied extensively and they've been watching people for years and so on. So the problem with that in children and adolescents is, is a perfect one, right? You think, well, geez, that's something we should have known before. Um, but in conditions like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, uh, and we don't even know what bipolar disorder is or it looks like in, in young children. Uh, but uh, a lot of medications are, uh, that might be effective in adults were making the assumption that they uh, would be effective in children. And that's, that's where the problem arises. Whenever, whenever you're assuming something, I don't know if anyone ever saw the famous <coughs> uh, episode of The Odd Couple, they ever come across it, but when you're assuming something, the, the TV show talks about, uh, when you assume you're, you're causing to potentially have to, to be a disaster. Yeah. Um, how do you determine, given that, like, for, like you were saying, for depression, I think you said depression, only 50% and depressants work partially. How do you determine the adequate dose in enough time? Like, oh, it's, it hasn't been enough time, it's not the adequate dose, versus, oh, it's not, this is not working. Like, how do you, what's the cutoff point? You know? uh, maybe five years or so, so now just kidding. Uh, hopefully not. I think um, you know, the antidepressants should begin to work within several weeks so that they can work within a matter of a week, be begin to work. The full effect is supposed to be general between four and six weeks. Um, and again, uh, uh, and four to six weeks when some when someone is on an adequate dose of the medication, um, uh, that's sort of the sort of the benchmark um, of how to sort of make that determination. So after six weeks, if it's not working, you would either say, "How do you decide? Oh, it's not working," or "Oh, maybe we should up the dose." Like maybe this medication doesn't work for you, or maybe we should keep like you know what I mean. Like do you just keep upping the dose until like what? Uh, um, well, you know that's it, the answer. Sort of it, it depends on right, that's more sort of the that's sort of the art form of psychopharmacology. Um, I think that as far as increasing the dose, um, sometimes that's the thing to do. Um, as long as someone's not having side effects. The, the pitfall of that is um, uh, when people end up on high doses or multiple medications, when what they really needed was a little more time. So if someone is suffering, right, 
I, you know, I want them to feel better. If they're calling or coming in and I see how much they're struggling and so on, I, I sometimes have to uh, watch myself because the tendency of the doctor or from anyone to me is that I, I want to do something. And so I want to show that I'm doing something. So that there can be a lot of pressure, you know. Well, as people go to a doctor uh, and you think you need a, an antibiotic and you leave empty-handed, it can feel feel like a rejection sometimes. It feels like they're, they're not, they're, 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 they don't even get a prescription. Um, so, you know, we're sort of living in that world, you know, also. But again, I think that um, the determination of that is sort of the, sort of the art form, and, and but using the science of it. Um, and um, so, even though it's not exact, there are sort of reasonable parameters, which is why, uh, right, I think what you may have been implying is if something's not working, right, you don't want to keep increasing and increasing the dose. Right? You have to be able to make that determination. If I can't make that determination today, that, that could be all right. You know, I want to be thinking about it actively and making that determination in, in sort of the near future, right, to avoid getting into that sort of pattern. So I can maybe add another medication and lower the one that, they were, and taper off the one that they were on before. I think the, the thing that one wants to avoid with multiple medications is someone's on something, it's not effective, and instead of taking them off of it, something else is added, and then something else could be added to that, right? Uh, that oftentimes could mean that maybe there's another diagnosis going on. Somebody may have a, an alcohol problem that's not, detected yet. That could explain what, what's happening. Um, so, um, I don't know that answers your, your question, but it, it, it really sort of depends on uh, you know, the, the individual patient. Um, a lot of it is, is sort of common sense uh, approach also. Someone else have a question? Let's say some drugs reach their effectiveness Antidepressants take time. Uh, antidepressants can take. Or something like Yes. No, if, if the dose is right. So if I give someone a Xanax and uh, say, you know, the next time you feel a panic attack coming on, take the, take the Xanax. Uh, if it doesn't work, uh, it might be because I'm giving the doses a little too low. Uh, I may say, well, you know what, next time take two. And that might be the trick. And so if it, right, there are medications like Xanax, like the psychostimulants for ADD, that work. If the doses, <coughs> once you determine what the right dose is, they work sort of immediately. Uh, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, can sometimes take weeks to work. And again, uh, the antidepressants, you know, for depression, generally like four to six weeks for the full effect. But if someone has OCD and I'm giving them uh, Prozac, which I could also give them for depression, uh, they're going to need higher doses, and it also will take several months longer than for depression. And so, um, again, during that time, someone is suffering, uh, not easy. Sometimes you can use something like Ativan or Clonopin or Xanax temporarily uh, to give someone some relief. And that's oftentimes what's, what's done if someone's having a, 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 a frequent panic attacks. Before the medication starts to work, which again could take a month or, or two, um, you can offer them something that could help them, you know, in the short term. Anyone else? That side effects. Um, um, they're, they're rarely serious. That's uh, uh, first and foremost. Um, I think if you look at the sheet that comes with the medication, 
uh, that has a list of potential side effects, right? That could be scary for anybody. Um, uh, or if you look at the big PDR that has, uh, you know, th those are all of the potential side effects. And usually they'll give you the percentage. Um, but, you know, you watch one of these commercials on TV <coughs> for some medication, and now they have to tell you all the side effects, right? right? If they didn't have to tell you that, believe, believe you me, they wouldn't, right? <laughs> They're required to. Um, but, right, uh, if you're watching that commercial and you see the person smiling, riding their bike or whatever, um, and then you start to hear in a nice, pleasant voice, you know, can cause, you know, fall off the bike and hit your head or something. You might be thinking, well, you know, if you were thinking, geez, I think I might like that medicine for me. Well, right, you start to think, well, I don't know, they keep going on and on. I, I ain't taking that stuff. Um, but I think that it's important to, to keep in mind that whether you're watching a commercial or you're looking at the list, uh, those are the potential side effects, and uh, most of them occur in a very small percentage. So, um, you know, again, I think it, it has to be taken into, into that context. Um, I can tell somebody you have a 99% uh, chance of um, not having uh, side effects. Right? That sounds pretty good. Or I could say you have a 1% chance that you can have side effects. Right? That might sound completely different to the same person. Right? 1% uh, jeez, 1% that that could you know, someone could think, well, that's, that's, that's too much, um, right? But then if you say, you know, 99% or, you know, that, so I think that um, it's important, I think, for, for everyone, the, the more information that someone can have to make these decisions, uh, you know, the better. But again, side effects are, are rarely serious, uh, just like this potential increase of suicidal behavior with children and adolescents that are uh, initiating pharmacotherapy with antidepressants, the serotonin reuptake inhibitor antidepressants, usually worse at the start of treatment. Um, and almost always they're dose dependent. And most side effects are short term, they're transient, uh, they're, uh, uh, they either go away or they're, they're treatable. Um, one of the things that we do more now is start with a lower dose, you know, the expression start low and go slow, um, that reduces the chance of side effects greatly. I remember when uh, Prozac, uh, fluoxetine, first came out um, around, uh, when I was just starting my residency around 1988, 80, uh, it was approved in the United States, 1887. Uh, it only came in a 20 milligram capsule. <coughs> And so, uh, wanted to treat someone with Prozac. I told him take take one in the morning. And um, uh, I remember I had a patient that uh, was driving down the Grand Central Parkway and had to pull over. It felt like he had like ten cups of coffee. That that's what we think is sort of the mechanism with, with children. That's sort of the serotonin sensitivity that person felt so, so restless and terrible feeling. Uh, but, you know, it, it subsided. Um, and so what we, uh, uh, right, that's something that really we didn't know about. Um, what we used to do back then was we used to tell people to open up the capsule um, and dump it into some orange juice, and drink half of it today, and put the other half back in your refrigerator and Drink that tomorrow. Just hope that no one else in your household you know, uh, drinks your orange juice. Um, but if you, I mean, that's what we used to do. Luckily, the capsule opened up. This was, you know, not that long ago. It's almost, uh, you know, embarrassing in a way. But that's all. That's what we had to tell people to do. Uh, but it, it took about ten years or so until Prozac was was, uh, you know, market manufactured in ten milligram size. Right. 
I, I think it was a no-brainer. It should have, you know, but that's that's uh, a, a, an example of. So now start someone on 10 milligrams, and I'll tell them to break it in half. It comes in a pill now. Um, in addition to the capsule, I can say, you know, start with five, take it three days, then go to 10. Uh, and by and large, that that's the way to go because that reduces the incidence of the side effects tremendously. Yeah. Um, there was a psychiatrist that I had worked with who, and it was mostly for antidepressants, would say like if you do have bad side effects in the beginning, like I guess nausea and that kind of stuff, that means oftentimes that it works for that individual. Do you think that that's true? Like he would always advise patients to push through because they would have bad side effects early on and want to stop. And he would say that usually when you get bad side effects in the beginning, that means it's more likely to work for you in the long term. Do you find that to be the case, or? Uh, well, that's a that's a good story there. Um, that don't, yeah. Um, um, that I'm not. Uh, that I don't know. I've never heard that one. Uh, I think that um, if I was talking to that psychiatrist, I might say, well, how about lower the dose for a few days, um, rather than making somebody, you know, pushing through when they're having terrible side effects. Right. Because that, first of all, is not fair. You're, you're giving someone something that, you know, if someone has cancer, they're taking chemotherapy. <coughs> Maybe you should tell them push through. Right. Uh, there might not be any other alternative, but there is an alternative. Unless someone is having a, uh, you know, profound depression, or maybe time is of the essence, maybe you do need to push the dose a little bit, hoping that, right, you may not have enough time to sort of, you know, take that extra week or so to build it up. Um, but someone like that probably should be in the hospital where they can be observed and so on. Right. Um, but I think, in general, if someone's having uh, uh, things like nausea um, or headaches or sweatiness from antidepressants, the thing to do is, is temporarily lower the dose. And I'd say 80% of the time, if I tell someone, let's lo lower the dose, um, and then side effects decrease, and then maybe several days later, you go back, back up, and most of the time, no problem. It's, it's a matter of sort of the body, it's your body getting to use the medication. Um, you know, so I think in general that would be my choice over uh, advising somebody to sort of push through. There, there might be some folks who um, might be sensitive to um, the, maybe the anxiety of side effects. Um, might be uh, experiencing the side effects and the way that they maybe describe it, it could possibly be that it's sort of exaggerated. I mean, I wouldn't assume that, and right, right. right off the bat, when it says they're nauseous, I, I can't really say that they're exaggerating. But so there might be some s smaller segment of folks that might need to use that approach, but, but I think by and large, I would, I would lower the dose temporarily. Yeah, I have a client. Um, I know he's on collateral, and I think he's also on lithium. I'm not sure if those two go hand in hand, but he often requires a lot of blood work. Um, I guess I'm not sure what they actually really test him for with the blood, but he has certain side effects with tremors, and then also it's like his tongue is constantly the tip is constantly rolling before he speaks, and um, I forgot what terminology he would use would use to describe that specific side effect. Just time reaction. Yeah, um, was it? I'm not going to play today, to be honest with you. I don't remember. But um, in his case, we were kind of nervous about it because at times it feels like it would increase, like the rotation of his tongue would either um, faster or slower. And for you know, it, was, it does this weird thing, but it's been going on like that for like several years now. But he always denies having any major side effects. And he takes cogent, but um, my supervisor noticed, and she was like, "This is wow, this is an obvious sign of 
side effects from the medication, but we deny side effects. That might be part of dyskinesia, which is a uh, long-term consequence of <coughs> taking antipsychotics, which you might be taking. Someone that might be taking Clozuril may, may have, which is a uh, sort of antipsychotic that requires blood monitoring every every two weeks because there's a potentially fatal side effect if your white count goes too low. So that medication is only dispensed, you only get two weeks at a time. If you don't get your blood test, you can't get any more. Uh, lithium also needs to have a, a, a blood test periodically. I think what you're describing is, is probably tardive dyskinesia. Yeah, I think that's the time. Which is uh, either it can be rocking or, or, or tongue <coughs> movements, uh, hands could be moving and yeah. um, lip smacking and so on. And that's a you know, terrible side effect of uh, taking Haldol and or prolixin for you know, years and years. Um, it's not unusual for somebody to not complain of, it, of that. Oh. It, might not, it, it, right? it might be uh, obvious to others, but the person themselves is not complaining if they're rocking or having a formal movement. That's a case where just because someone's not complaining of something doesn't mean that it's not something that needs to be dealt with it or treated. Um, but um, it's not easy to treat, actually. Something. I mean, that's one of the reasons why uh, you don't want to put someone on these medications. And uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, if someone has a severe depression with psychosis, <coughs> which can happen, uh, you'll start to treat them with an antipsychotic and an antidepressant at the same time. Uh, but after a month or so, they're feeling better that the antidepressant is also starting to work because the antipsychotic may begin to work a little quicker. Um, that person, we want to get them off of the antipsychotic and then to leave them on the antidepressant. Uh, if someone's left on both, well, then you can, they're on, they're on a medication that maybe they, they don't need. And how terrible is that if they get, you know, side effects particularly Part of dyskinesia is, is an irreversible neurological side effect. The, the, only, the way to treat it is sometimes you have to increase the dose of the antipsychotic. It's like one of those, you know, uh, catch 22s. And so that temporarily makes it better, but then it eventually gets worse. So the, the best thing to do is try and avoid that in the first place. The newer antipsychotics are much, have much less of an incidence of that. But you, you, I think what you're noticing is this called tardive dyskinesia. <coughs> okay. Um, so some of these points I've already uh, uh, touched on um, before we get to talk about the actual medications. Um, you know, polypharmacy is, is you know, uh, anytime you, someone's taking more than one medication, it could be polypharmacy. But that is what all, you know, the cocktail and regimens, that's all polypharmacy. And obviously, uh, that's something that uh, can be uh, very necessary. Um, but you want to make sure that that is necessary. As we were talking about before, um, you have to discontinue medications that are ineffective. And sometimes you can, don't have to stop them abruptly lower than slowly, sometimes it's not always apparent that something is ineffective. But if you lower it slower uh, and symptoms emerge, then you can bring it, bring it back. And if you're monitoring someone and following up with them, it's, less, it's much less of a risk. Uh, medications generally should be tapered sl slowly. I've never had a patient who had a good response to an antidepressant uh, that I've talked about uh, uh, coming off of it when appropriate that was not anxious about, about that. How could you not be? Um, and by and large, if, uh, if it's, the antidepressant is tapered off slowly, um, most of the time people do very well. Yeah. Can you give me a little insight into the difference between uh, an allergy to a medication and just the side effects? Is, is an allergy just an an over-intensified side effect, or is it its own unique 
component because I mean, if you're allergic to a drug, don't they say you can never take it again? Yeah, that's what of the dose. An allergic reaction, you can get a ra rash, uh, swelling of the airway. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's an, that's an allergic reaction. Yeah. And then, is it dose related or is it? The second any of that gets in your system, you're going to have the same. Well, you know, sometimes it could be, uh, you know, medications have um, called the excipient. They have other things in them besides the, it could, that, that could be what someone's allergic to. I think, though, that, um, you know, these things all risk versus benefit. If yeah. someone, uh, you know, if I, if I had a, when I was a kid, I had a rash to penicillin. I have to take in penicillin. Uh, there's other things that I could take if I have an infection. But I think in general, I think if someone has an allergic reaction to, to medication, you can assume that, that if there's something else that you can try instead of the needs that you should. But again, so side effects are usually, uh, that's not, not a completely different mechanism than an allergy. The allergy is sort of the, like the hypersensitivity reaction that someone has to something that their body is responding to. Uh, the side effects are um, sort of the adverse reactions to a medication that are sort of more you know, potentially predictable in this in sort of general population. Okay, so let's quickly go over some of these, me these medications, and I'll, I'll try to do this a little faster. This is because I think the stuff that we were talking about before um, might tend to see less in your books and, and so on. Uh, and so this stuff is something that you can, you can look up if you have a client who's on a particular medication. And uh, I think, you know, it's the kind of thing that as you center your reading on your, your patients or your clients, you know, that makes it easier to remember. And you can't necessarily remember it. Well, these are all the antipsychotics, and these are all the antidepressants, and so on. But I think just to get you a little familiar with it, with it if, if you aren't already, um, the major categories are the antipsychotics, uh, mood stabilizers, uh, which are used more frequently for you know, bipolar disorder, uh, antidepressants, the anti-anxiety medications, uh, sleep medications, and stimulants or psychostimulants. We use generally for attention deficit disorder, sometimes for uh, you know, narcolepsy is falling asleep abruptly, um, which fortunately none of us have that. Um, so the antipsychotics. Uh, used for schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, which is a sort of a combination, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's a, sort of a combination of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, not, 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 not fun, not, none, of, none of these are fun to have, obviously. Um, uh, major depression with psychosis or psychotic features <coughs> requires antipsychotic medication most of the time. Uh, bipolar disorder, uh, to stabilize somebody who's having an acute uh, um, you know, manic episode, uh, for example, requires sometimes uh, it could be a sort of a rapid uh, dosing of, of uh, food stabilizers. Uh, and antipsychotics, uh, or uh, of antipsychotics rather. Um, and it could also be used to maintain uh, someone has bipolar disorder to prevent them from having a relapse. Uh, Antipsychotics also used for cocaine <coughs> or amphetamine intoxication. Um, you know, cocaine uh, overuse can look like paranoid schizophrenia. Um, could be hearing voices, could become acutely paranoid, could become argumentative, lose control, and so on, and suspicious. I remember when I was a, a, a resident, I went to visit, a, worked on an inpatient unit, and we had, had a guy who got totally psychotic at home, thought that the neighbors were spying on him, and all that kind of a thing. And um, 
was, was doing large quantities of cocaine. Um, it, uh, and so uh, the difference is if it's schizophrenia, somebody, it, it doesn't go away. You know? um, I remember I went back to his apartment, uh, uh, to, you know, uh, which was fascinating. Uh, so before he was discharged, he went back to his apartment and so on. And, um, you know, he had aluminum foil over the windows and took all the stuff out from his closets. It was all in the middle of the room. He had told me that he put that there were daggers coming up through the, the, the floor, but all it was was a little nail, you know. Um, but so, uh, you know, symptom for symptom, uh, you know, cocaine or amphetamine psychosis or intoxication can look like schizophrenia. And uh, we would use antipsychotics for cocaine intoxication also, but that would be temporary, right? That's not something that someone would only be taking you know, for a week or so. Um, uh, Tourette's disease, uh, which is involuntary motor or verbal tics, uh, are treated with antipsychotics. And uh, the, ag the agitation and dementia, as I mentioned before, we use antipsychotics but they don't really work, uh, and we have no studies uh, uh, to show that they work. And so there's a whole kind, they can sometimes uh, cause uh, cardiac side effects in, in the elderly. So that's an area where medications have been over, over prescribed, um, and particularly you know, if they're not effective. Uh, and boy, I wish we had some better treatment for that. that would be so far. Um, so the antipsychotics, um, the uh, first generation antipsychotics, you know, Haldol and Prolixin and Trilophon and Thorazine, and Melaril, um, you can remember them and now you can forget them, uh, I guess, because they're, they're hardly ever used anymore. Um, the, this was the first generation, and, and as I mentioned before, First one was Thorazine, which I can't remember the year that it was uh, discovered, but it was again sort of discovered accidentally. Um, Thorazine, very very sedating. Uh, you know that was the case of where the psychiatric patients would be sort of zombie out in hospitals and falling asleep, and you know that was sort of a, you know, I think it was, I think in psychiatry we still I mean obviously people paid the price for that, but. I think psychiatry as a field is still sort of paying a price for, for that happening or allowing that to go on and not recognizing that something something wasn't right. Um, sometimes but that that was you know wasn't too long ago where uh, you know in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, whatever you had psychiatrically, if something was wrong, you went to a psychiatrist and you either were given Thorazine or you were sometimes given electroconvulsive therapy or shock therapy, or you were put into psychoanalysis. It was sort of, that, that's all we had. Um, you know, we used to treat schizophrenia with uh, intensive psychotherapy. There used to be a theory that schizophrenia is caused by, by, by the mother, the mother. Uh, uh, you know, who, who else, I guess it's another case of mothers getting blamed for, for everything, but that was the, you know, that, that couldn't be more wrong, obviously. Um, it also pejorative, you know, that's another story. But um, uh, again, it wasn't too long ago that schizophrenia was treated by psychoanalysis. Uh, and uh, the thought was that the mother that was very critical one moment and then loving the, the next moment and then critical cause, was the cause of schizophrenia. Um, but, um, but we know that schizophrenia is, is a medical disorder. Uh, it's called a psychiatric disorder, but these psychiatric disorders, these are medical problems. It needs to be of the brain. So if someone has diabetes, that's the same kind of thing that's going on with your pancreas. Uh, schizophrenia, similar phenomenon, but of the brain. Um, so uh, these first generation antipsychotics, you know, this was along the lines of killing a fly with a sledgehammer. Uh, it would cause 
Parkinson like Parkinson's disease like side effects um, apathesia which uh, and so the Parkinson's disease people that and sometimes you see for someone that you would think that looks maybe like they've been homeless that, you know psychiatric uh, condition like a lifelong uh, psychiatric condition that they've been on these medications and they're at this kind of you know, their hand, they're rocking they're shuffling with their feet they have their face looks flat those are all symptoms of, of Parkinson's disease that's a side effect of these medications um, they would commonly cause akathisia which is a, a sense of internal restlessness where you, you sit down and then you got to stand up and then you got to sit down again and then you walk I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like you're constantly overdosing on coffee and you just can't, can't sit still. Um, dystonia might, might have been what your what person with eyes roll back in their head um, or the tongue can feel like it's getting swollen. That's sort of an acute, it could be sort of an acute medical emergency, um, which is treatable, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's not, not fun to, to have that, obviously. Uh, tardive dyskinesia is the long-term is, so is the long-term consequence. It's a neurological condition from uh, uh, long-term use of these first-generation antipsychotics: lip smacking, facial grimacing, normal body movements, and so on. And that, that's called tardive dyskinesia, which I think is you know, what you have to first off. So I have a question. And that's your reversal. Tardive dyskinesia, generally, yeah, it doesn't ever really go away. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's not. It's sort of considered in a way sort of untreatable and uh, unfortunately uh, irreversible. Um, so, in around 1990, the second generation of antipsychotics, the first one was Risperdal. Um, and Antiprexa, Abilify, Geodone, Clozapine, Seroquel. Um, they, they're uh, better, but uh, I think as you may have heard, right, there's the same thing happened again in that with side effects that uh, were not apparent early on or didn't, weren't revealed in, in the studies and so on. Um, so uh, Zyprexa. Uh, which, you know, uh, is, isn't really used anymore. But boy, when I was working in the hospital, the Zyprexa rep, drug reps were coming around, bringing lunch all the time, and giving out, uh, when, they, when they found out that it causes tremendous weight gain, they used to come around giving out scales, actually. <laughs> I think I still have the Zyprexa scale. Um, I think the solution is not to have a nice scale, but to stop the Zyprexa. Um, but, um, uh, but these medications in general are effective and have uh, much less side effects. Um, but they are not side effect free. Um, the main problem is weight gain. The more dangerous potential problem are metabolic deregulations where someone, and this was more common with Zyprexa, it happens to have been in the young men more than commonly African American men, and I'll never forget in the early 90s working at Roosevelt Hospital, and I uh, was doing a consultation on a young man back in the early 20s, all of a sudden was in a diabetic coma. Um, and we had not heard anything about this, and it was because he, he was also schizophrenic and he was taking his depression. He did, he did okay. Um, but. Uh, so people that take these medications need to have their uh, glucose done before you start them and checked periodically, particularly in the beginning. You gotta weigh them, uh, watch their weight. You gotta also check their cholesterol. Um, and if you do those things, you can catch any irregularities before they right, start to become either irreversible or too hard to reverse. Um, you know, with weight gain, which is a potential side effect also of antidepressants, the only time I've ever had a patient that gained a lot of weight was someone that 
and I stopped seeing me and all of a sudden showed up six weeks, months later or so, I think got a prescription from elsewhere that he gained 20 pounds. And <coughs> usually if you, walk, if you catch on to this, someone maybe is gaining, plus you're gaining five Thank pounds, you. You, can, you can deal with it. You can lower the medication, you can try something else. But, um, but these medications are, are effective. Uh, they're better than the older antipsychotics for the neg anyone know what the, some of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia are? The negative symptoms, positive symptoms? A flat affect, uh, the lack of, you know, it's not, it's not the symptoms that show themselves, like the hallucinations. Right, or hallucinations. But so the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which have always been harder to treat, uh, are apathy, um, you know, sort of flat affect, sort of lack of motivation and cognitive impairment. Positive symptoms are sort of delusions and hallucinations. Um, and so these medications will treat the negative symptoms better than the Haldol and the Prolixin class. Um, but again, weight gain, uh, diabetes potentially, cardiac abnormality, uh, rhythm abnormalities, elevated cholesterol. Uh, so those things, uh, and it took, took about 10 years before, that's a long time, before um, we sort of caught on to all of this, which always reminds me that uh, just because the medication is new doesn't mean that it's better. For um, weight gain, is it, um, I mean, is it sometimes possible that the dosage can't be lowered, so just, um, it's just a side effect that they have to deal with, or? You said with blinking? With weight gain. Oh, oh, with weight gain. It sounds a little like you said with blinking, and I'm like, oh boy. Um, <laughs> uh, with weight gain, uh, you know, it depends. I mean, so, sometimes, for one person of five pound or seven or whatever pound weight gain could be okay. For another person, it's, it's not acceptable. It's the same sometimes with sexual side effects. I mean, it's, you know, it's really up to the person, um, you know, but also in the context of is there, is there another treatment that could be equally effective, right? That, that's not always, Necessarily the case. Uh, so your question was. I mean, I'm thinking if, if, the, if the dose is lowered. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, is it possible that the dose can't be lowered? Oh, cannot be lowered. And so, I mean, I've I've seen like some people with at least 20, 20, 30 pounds weight gain, and just you know, it's like just oh yeah, it's just a side effect, and this is. Right, I mean, I, I, it's, you know, um, what, whether you can get someone to exercise and diet, right, that's, that'll help for sure. It's not always, doesn't always happen in real life and so on. I think that the, most of us can, you know, relate to. Um, I think with antidepressants, uh, what uh, actually is not studied enough is the fact that um, uh, if someone's doing well, <coughs> Uh, they can sometimes be maintained on a lower dose. Uh, and, and so all the side effects will, will, will decrease also, including the, the weight gain. Just a few minutes, thanks. Um, because the, most of the, um, the research is funded by the pharmaceutical industry, um, they're not funding research to you know, give people less medication. But we know in uh, um, but we know that in real life, uh, um, if you lower the, the dose after someone's been doing okay, maybe after a few months, they can do just as well on the lower dose. And you know, theory is the less less medication, the better. Um, and these side effects are almost all of them are, do are dose dependent and, and can be uh, you know, greatly ameliorated. I have to breeze through this very, very quickly. Um, uh, mood stabilizers, you know, that's for bipolar disorder, and you know, there's 
whole different variation of bipolar one and bipolar two, and um, as I mentioned, schizoaffective disorder, rapid cycling. I mean, I don't, these are things you can look up if you, if you would need to. Um, not, not easy to diagnose. Um, you know, cyclothymia, but the, these are all variants of the uh, mood swings, which um, again, subtle differences, but the mood, the mood stabilizers uh, are really very effective. The, um, the main class of um, oh, I think uh, 11 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, Typically the end of Oh, okay. <laughs> about five minutes. Um, lithium was uh, one of the first mood stabilizers that very, very good medication it does have side effects uh, that can be uh, troublesome, uh, serious. Um, uh, it's safer to take during pregnancy, but you can't breastfeed if you're taking lithium. Um, you have to check the thyroid and the kidney and, and so on. But again, there are people that have bipolar disorder that have been taking lithium for decades and are don't have any problem with their thyroid, their kidneys are good, and they had, you know, happy, productive lives. Um, but it's a medication that has to be, you know, sort of monitored and watched, you know, uh, you know carefully all the time. Um, the Depakote, which is also uh, uh, called valproic acid, is the generic, uh, has sort of taken over in the last 20 years as sort of the first line mood stabilizer. Felt that the side effect profile is a little bit less, but still it's got plenty of side effects potentially. Um, uh, also have to watch weight, and it can cause tremors, and it could be sedating, and you have to take a blood test and so on. Um, very dangerous to take during pregnancy. It can't be taken during pregnancy. Um, some other ones are Tegretol, uh, Remictal, which is uh, the these are all uh, medications that we use for epilepsy. And, you know, as I was talking about before, with children, where a lot of the studies uh, in medications have been done in adults, use in children hasn't been studied adequately. Uh, a lot of the information we have about these anti epileptic medications are from research done for epilepsy, not for bipolar disorder. And so that's something you know also. Um, antidepressants, sort of mentioned uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. There was an older class of antidepressants, just you know, they're called the tricyclic antidepressants, which also had higher side effects and be potentially fatal in overdose. So if someone was profoundly depressed and you using these medications, um, you had to be very, very careful. You could only give somebody maybe five or 10 days worth of medication until they were sure that they were feeling better. Um, but, but you could actually, it was very possible to, to kill oneself. With Prozac and Zoloft, it's much safer in overdose. So almost impossible to, uh, to die from it and all of these medications. Um, and then there's what they call, those are serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There's uh, these dual acting antidepressants like Effexor uh, and Cymbalta that work on serotonin and norepinephrine. black box warning about the increased uh, risk of suicidality uh, in children, um, especially during the first month of treatment. Um, so I think we, we need to stop it. I usually never get a chance to talk about sleeping pills and, um, and psychostimulants, but um, yeah, I think if so that's something if you have a client that's on one of those, I think you can, you can look it up. So, uh,